Thank you so much for inviting me here. And um, also, Amy, thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, so it's such a pleasure and an honor and a little surreal to be already back at high school and uh, sharing with you the research experiences I've had since I graduated. Um, so today, um, as my talk's title suggests, I will be speaking about microbes and their growing relationship with artworks and cultural heritage. Um, but before I get there, given my research interests in memory and memorialization, um, and also given the topic of this event, growth, uh, I thought I would um, uh, reminisce a little bit. I want to recall and perhaps speculate on how NCSSM shaped uh, the research that I'm doing today. In particular, my current research draws on uh, ethnographic fieldwork that I conducted in the United States and Italy um, with scientists from different backgrounds, um, scientists like physicists, chemists, and biologists, to understand how they brought their perspectives on um, how nature works in order to develop new technologies for restoring art and cultural heritage. And these objects range from the Milan Cathedral to paintings by Jackson Pollock. And this morning, I will demonstrate how Italian scientists are using microbiology logics and practices to reshape um, what artworks and cultural heritage can look like. But before art and microbes entered my life, there was a sea slug called Aplesia Californica. <laughs> my very first independent research project was conceived and executed while I was a student here at Science and Math. Um, I was just accepted into Dr. Sheck's uh, research in biology class, and I was cramming my head to figure out what I was going to do. All I knew was that I didn't want to do what I said I was going to do in my application. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I remember wandering around campus, um, bouncing ideas off of my senior mentor, and I had this brief moment of pseudo clarity where I decided that what I wanted to study was the act of misremembering. Um, I had this kind of embarrassingly naive notion that if I could solve the problem of misremembering, I could help solve many of the world's social conflicts. Uh, social conflicts that I imagined uh, ranged from disagreements between individual friends and disagreements among uh, entire nations. Um, this is super embarrassing to admit, but it is true that I think um, many people are heavily, heavily invested in the question of what really happened, right, all the time, and in all kinds of frames and contexts, one of which I will relate um, in a little while. So I'm rummaging through all these, uh, all this biological literature on memory, and um, here comes a plesia, a sea slug, which turns out to be a model organism for neurobiological research in memory formation. Uh, they exhibit this behavior called the gill and siphon withdrawal reflex. And scientists from the 60s and 70s, uh, most notably led by a neuroscientist and Nobel laureate, uh, Eric Kendall found that they varied the duration of their reflex according to different kinds of stimuli. And what was really amazing was that they uh, retained memories of the lessons that the scientists gave them long after the training sessions were over. Um, and what really stuck out to me was the fact that their behavioral changes correlated to physical changes in these sea slugs' uh, neurons. And this concreteness was what uh, really, and this concreteness um, was what uh, really caught my eye. I loved this, that memory, something as intangible and elusive, um, something as in, uh, intangible and elusive as memory could be made as material, as visible, and um, as hard of a fact as the increasing and decreasing number of synaptic con uh, connections that one could actually count on a microscopic slide. So uh, this revelation led me to do many absurd things. Um, I actually raised uh, sea slugs in saltwater tanks and fed them pieces of romaine lettuce. I squirted them with jets of water with a water pick 
which is um, a water foster device that you're supposed to use to clean your teeth. Um, I timed the duration of their withdrawal reflex and I dissected them and mounted their neuronal, gang neuronal ganglia on microscope slides. Um, things that I cannot believe that I actually did. <laughs> um, and to, and um, to this day, whenever I see romaine lettuce, I think about the smell of salt water, I think about stress, and I think about um, general textures of sliminess and slipperiness. It's terrible. <laughs> and in the end, because of this experience, I graduated science and math, and I entered college with the aim of becoming a neurobiologist. Um, it was going to be the brain. I was convinced that told me why and how people remembered and forgot. Um, as a cultural anthropologist now, as an anthropologist of science and technology, I think about memory a little differently. Uh, so the questions are um, basically, what makes time hold still? How do certain histories persist while others are forgotten, uh, ignored, or uh, intentionally or unintentionally distorted. Um, rather than think about electric signals and the, uh, and the travel of neurotransmitters and the tiny gaps between neurons, um, I instead think about how memory formation happened in the conversations and practices, everyday practices of people. Um, if, as an aspiring neuroscientist, I wanted to think about the biological process that made people remember and forget, I am now interested in the cultural processes that lead to social memory. And like I stumbled um, upon uh, the sea slugs, I stumbled upon a group of microbiologists at the University of Milan in Milan, Italy. Um, this was a team uh, led by Francesca Capitelli, and she was interested in how uh, microbes are growing on uh, objects of art and cultural heritage, and how she could contribute to practices of conservation and restoration. So here are a couple of examples of what these microbiologists were doing. Uh, this is Michela Gambino. Uh, I went to the Monumental Cemetery of Milan with her, and we went because she had been tracking the growth of um, a layer of microbial communities called biofilm uh, on the stone monuments and, and tombs and the statues that were in the, in the cemetery. Um, she was particularly interested in how uh, the microbial growth changed over the course of a year because she was interested in any effects of seasonal change. She was using a particular technique um, whereby she wanted to measure microbial growth by measuring the color um, of the microbes on the surfaces of these artifacts. And this is really amazing. The idea came from watching leaves change color in the fall. Right? So just as leaves lose chlorophyll um, with the changing seasons, the argument went uh, microbes, uh, photosynthetic bacteria, would also change color in response to changes in humidity, temperature, um, nutrient availability. Right? So we went around with this colorimeter and um, measured color. The color of microbes might prove to be a uh, dependable natural signifier of these artifacts deterioration, um, Michaela argued. And uh, it, was, it would be potentially very uh, helpful for conservators because by hovering this device over the surface, it was a very minimally invasive procedure, um, especially compared to, for example, taking samples from the stone artifact directly. So conservators have long battled what they consider to be the destructive actions of microbes. Uh, they reach out to microbiologists to identify um, which microbes and how they do uh, damage to the surface of artifacts. Um, for instance, they can cause reddish-brown spots on paper. They can cause pits on the surfaces of stone. Um, and tracking the color of microbes in, on the statuary is one effort, one um, uh, example of this effort to figure out whether and how microbes are harming uh, the, surf the uh, artifacts of um, art and cultural heritage. But 
Francesca and her team are interested in not only doing that, but also in this idea of using microbes to help conservators actually save these artifacts. Um, so a few weeks after my trip to the uh, uh, cemetery, I followed Annalisa Baloy, who's another collaborator of Francesca, to Salunto, which is an ancient Phoenician city on the northern coast of uh, Sicily. And the caretakers of Salunto had uh, reached out to Annalisa because their fragile, um, their ancient fragile terraces, which you see pictured under these um, sort of glass cases, were crumbling. And Annalisa had a bacteria that uh, they wanted her to try, which would precipitate calcium carbonate and actually help to consolidate uh, this stone. And according to Annalisa, right, um, the, since microbes are natural objects themselves, this was also the most effective, um, least invasive, and most natural solution to deterioration. So what do these practices on art and, culture, and cultural heritage have to do with memory? Um, preservation, conservation, restoration can mean different things to different people, and um, it depends on also not only who you ask, but when and where. In general, the conservators are pretty committed to the idea that artifacts contain um, very important information and represent stories that are worth transmitting to future generations. Um, that, um, and I find, and as a result, I find the work of conserving and restoring artifacts really fascinating um, because it navigates a kind of paradox, um, a paradox, if you will, of memory keeping. So on one hand, at its heart, conservation restoration, at least in its Western tradition, wants to preserve the material aspects of an artifact that are supposed to represent its, to represent um, the artifact's originality, um, or to recover them, right, if those material aspects have been lost. But they struggle, conservators struggle with the fact that time inevitably passes. And not only do the materials of the artifacts change over time, but also the social meanings that are attached to those material aspects change over time. And as a result, practitioners are constantly negotiating what being faithful to that original artifact means. And I find conservators remarkable for the ways in which they have to work on a tangible object. Um, at the same time that they deliberate these intangible philosophical questions about what authenticity is, a notion that is as complex as interpreting an artist's intent um, or deciding how clean or beautiful an artifact should be. And at the end of the day, conservation restoration is controversial. Controversial um, and uh, the cleaning of the Sistine Chapel, right, is just one example. Um, controversial because uh, the practice, the practice um, are based. The practices are based upon claims of expertise, right? Who has the right kinds of knowledge uh, to decide or to contribute to decisions about what should last? What is interesting about this, from an anthropological perspective, is that uh, it is not self-evident that one expert. Um, is privileged in these decisions over another. Um, why and how do scientists make themselves relevant to these conversations? And because these artifacts have traditionally been the domain of people like artists and historians, conservators and artisans. And I argue that microbiologists are changing the terms of artifacts deterioration and recovery um, according to the logic of their discipline, according to the logics and practices of microbiology. Their knowledge and passion for microbial life actually reconfigures what artworks and cultural heritage are supposed to look like by simply, for instance, just highlighting that microbial presence exists, that microbes are there. Um, they can inform conservators on how to get rid of microbes, or they can even show conservators how microbes can help them. When Michaela sent me this watercolor sketch, she wrote to me that she had painted a summary of uh, her proposal to study how microorganisms contributed to biodiversity. Uh, Michaela's illustration captures how, in addition to using um, 
microbiology to understand cultural heritage, scientists can also use cultural heritage to understand a larger, um, a larger picture about natural ecosystems. So here she has painted a landscape of C and H on the left, which stands for cultural and natural heritage, um, which is supposed to play host to these SABs, which are subaerial biofilms, the microbial communities that grow um, and thrive at the interface of solid and air. And Michaela is pointing out, right, like, um, as we learn in high school, um, that like um, nitrogen, uh, like water, microbes can travel between earth and sky and um, contribute to biodiversity. Uh, it's these movements, she suggests, that may explain otherwise invisible dispersal and invasion mechanisms that help to maintain microbial diversity in the environment. And on this view, the rock cliff or rock monument is just one piece of a complex system that selects for particular forms of microbial life. So I'll end with two summarizing comments. Um, first, memory formation is material, um, not only because the neurobiological processes behind them can be material, but, um, but because uh, how people remember isn't confined to what happens inside their heads, um, I think that what we remember is inextricable from the material artifacts that are said to stand in for the past, as well as the everyday material practices, such as using a color colorimeter to uh, measure deterioration, or using microbial bodies and cells to restore artifacts. Second, and relatedly, memory formation is social. This microbiological research on art and cultural heritage didn't happen, didn't emerge from a vacuum. Um, seemingly novel connections between art and uh, microbes are entangled in historical, economic, political, and cultural conditions in which certain commitments have already been made. Uh, we are living in a world in which the microbe is increasingly feared and um, uh, we are also fascinated by their potential benefits. So um, on one, new research directions are emerging on not only antibiotic resistance, um, but also the human micro, microbiome, uh, or the hope that bacterial genes might become the next data storage device. The latest microbiological interventions in conservation restoration is just a part of this larger dialogue. And moreover, just as my research um, with Aplesia from the get-go relied on the generosity of the community at Science and Math, um, uh, the practices I observed in Italy called on a vast network of uh, different kinds of experts, not just scientists and engineers, but also uh, social scientists, humanists, humanists artists. Memory formation is social, and it should be diversely so. Meanwhile, it's important to track the different voices that um, usher these pasts into the future. Who and what counts, and who and what gets left out, is um, something really important to keep in mind. History is just as heavily edited as uh, the short reminiscences of a uh, TEDx talk. Thank you very much.